to begin with a standard disclaimer, largely that there is no warranty granted or inferred with this talk, if you take the cover off it's your fault. Additionally, if I disappear, um, please get in touch with the nearest North Korean embassy, they have flags and everything. Um, last abduction that the North Koreans were involved in was in 1987, where they decided to abduct a South Korean student at MIT, who was at MIT, I should say, when he was on holiday in Austria. Uh, I recently came back from Plumacon, where I gave this talk, also in Australia, to survive that. But, you know, we're never now. So, if you don't hear from me, please contact me. So, a couple of quotes. Um, firstly, from everybody's favourite, the stock inside by author Jill Jawa. You know, if there's any of it, it lies on the Second quote from Kim Jong il himself, where he claims himself an inter internet master. That's not that surprising as Kim Jong il is a master of everything. When Kim Jong-il was born, apparently there were rainbows and swallows in the air above North Korea. He can leap tall buildings with a single bound, and he is faster than a speaking bullet. So the fact that he's a master of the internet should come as no surprise. So, who am I, and why the hell are you bothering to listen to me? Um, with regards to the second point, I don't know. I'm very unaware I haven't had nearly enough caffeine, and I'm probably completely incoherent. As well as being completely incoherent, um, as you may have noticed by the dulcet tones, I'm from the UK, so my apologies for that. Um, I'm the co-founder of a new company called Typos Research Labs. Uh, we basically break things and build software. Um, I've given this talk a couple of times. Every time I give this talk, it gets a bit better. So hopefully in about five years' time, it'll be a really good talk. Um, I'd like to give a couple of statements that I am not, nor have I ever been, a member of the Communist Party. I am not, nor have I ever been, never been, um, an intelligence operative, largely because I lack one of the prerequisites, which is intelligence. Um, additionally, I've never been to North Korea, and I don't speak Korean, so there are various pronunciations in this which will come out all kinds of wrong. So if you do speak Korean, please don't stone me to death butchering your language. Um, I'm also incredibly sick and tired and fed up and pissed off with the whole cyber security sideshow. Um, what, what, what I mean more specifically is the cyber warfare sideshow, whereby we're all going to die in some digital arm again launched by lunatics and laptops. Not going to happen. So, what the hell is this talk about? Well, it's not about squirrels, unfortunately. Uh, it is, however, uh, about North Korea. Um, largely because everybody, it seems, in terms of the popular press in the US particularly, is terrified of North Korea. I mean, it's not that surprising as much that everybody in the US is terrified of everything. So, you know, North Korea is just one ball. Um, North Korea is part of the axis of evil, which makes it sound as if it should be in a Batman comic, but it's not. Um, as you probably are aware, the DPRK is basically a Stalinist dictatorship pulled over by an evil little shit in a bad wig. Um, it's also interesting the kind of an internet black hole. Um, so what I've tried to do is examine the um, external and internal infrastructure as much as I can and try and delineate what the relationships are. Uh, that might not sound to be particularly about computer hacking, but it kind of is, um, in as much that uh, my understanding is that hacking in its purest form is an examination of closed systems. North Korea is like the ultimate closed system. So, what point will be in this talk? Well, uh, judging by my hangover, much sense, but there will also be no OD, there will be no technical demo. There'll be no vendor pitches. Uh, there'll hopefully be no, not that much people learning. Um, the annoying thing about that is the technical standard of this conference has been really good, and now I get to talk shit for an hour and a half, so my apologies for that in advance. So, when people think about North Korea, they typically think about a couple of things. Uh, Ministry of Silly Walks, military walking. Uh, the lovely, lovely Kim Jong-il, that they're represented by his best and most famous characterization, and the oncoming apocalypse. <laughs> um, there is a little bit too, little bit more to North Korea than that, although, you know, Team America did kind of nail it. So, um, but since I gave this talk first uh, confidence in Poland in May, uh, something fairly interesting has happened, namely that North Korea and South Korea have suddenly remembered they're at war. I mean, they've, been up, they've been in a state of war for the last 50 years, so it's kind of easy to forget. But, you know, they've just remembered. Um, 
They remembered that in March 2010 when um, a South Korean battleship was struck and sank. Now, there's a couple of uh, theories about that. One theory is it was the North Koreans, largely because they discovered like an antique torpedo from the 1940s. And the second theory is that the South Korean battleship in question straight into the DMZ, hit the American line and fell into the bottom of the water. Regardless, though, it does make this talk slightly more topical and less the rantings of a good Englishman. So, there's a couple of parts to this. Uh, the first part is incredibly boring and incredibly tedious, but also incredibly useful. What I'm going to try and do, uh, if it's actually possible, is distill the technical infrastructure of the country into 30 slides, which you know, is slightly, a slight challenge, but there you go. The second bit is much more interesting, but this bit's quite dull, so you walk. Okay, so I'd like to begin with yes, another quote. Uh, this is from the North Korean um, Socialist Constitution. Uh, the North Koreans are kind of like the Americans, and much that they have a constitution. I'm from the UK, where we don't. Uh, basically, that uh, constitutional uh, amendment states that uh, you know, citizens are guaranteed the freedom of speech of the press, of assembly, demonstration, and association. This is in the Stalinist dictatorship, so I'm not quite sure how that varies up, but you know, it's interesting to bear in mind. So, um, the first thing to point out is that North Korea has got incredibly limited internet access. Uh, it does, it does, however, have the internet, uh, which is very, very highly regulated and very, very, very expensive. Uh, that was set up in 2000, uh, and it was expanded by the Korean Computer Center branch offices uh, located in Berlin about a while later. Uh, basically, uh, the internal internet of God is called Pyongyang. See, I told you I've the Korean language. And, um, Reportedly, to set it up, it cost about $950,000. Uh, that ties back, as I say, to the KCC, which I'll talk to about a, a little bit more later. So the thing is, um, what the hell is going on with the North Korean internet, or internet, and what does it do? Well, according to Wikipedia, which is a source of all reliable knowledge in the universe, and, you know, a lazy man's uh, alternative to doing real research, uh, Kung Yang, Right, uh, is basically the DPRK approved version of the internet. What happens is, uh, let's say you're a researcher and you want to publish your research in North Korea, you submit your research to a uh, censorship board, that then goes to a state education board, that then goes to a political board, and you know, provided you haven't written somewhere in your research, <laughs> then you get approved. Um, according to Wikipedia, as I say, um, all of the people in uh, utilise Chrome Yang in terms of accessing, uh, accessing the internet or intranet in North Korea. It's a free service for public use. Now, I have an issue with that. I have um, many issues with Wikipedia, but that, with that particular statement in particular, as much that the average um, annual income is less than $2,000 a year. So, my point is. How the hell have people got computers to use this wonderful free service for public use? Doesn't actually happen by magic Wikipedia, you know? So, as well as the state run internet, which, you know, is not the internet as you and I know it, there are no long cards there. Um, in 2001, in Shenyang, China, uh, there was a financial institution called Silly Bank, which offered mail relaying for North Korea. Um, as of 2007, Silly Bank is no longer online, thank you, Bob, I've got all. Which makes you wonder how North Koreans send email. So, more about Pyongyang. Basically, uh, as I said, founded in 2000, and it reportedly consists of a number of components, namely a browser, or an email, um, an email program, how they can't send email, and heavily filtered news groups, and a heavily, heavily, heavily filtered search engine. Um, as I said earlier, for resellers to make it on there, it's got to get through numerous boards, numerous uh, political um, assignations, shall we say. And how is it accessed? Well, uh, dial up service located in China. Um, it's basically, think AT&T on a mass scale. You know when AT&T first came out, they were like, okay, you can only have this information about AT&T and our wonderful services. Pyongyang, Pyongyang is basically the North Korean alternative to, uh, to AOL. So, 
Apart from Pyongyang, how else does the Hermit Kingdom actually communicate? Well, there's a guy called Marcus Nolan who did some amazing research on the actual number of telephone lines installed based on what he did was he took the electrical grid and from the electrical grid tried to delineate what the connections were, what the, what the electrical grid was powering, yada, 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 yada. Also, interviewed a couple of people that come out of North Korea and that's how he got the information. Now, according to his figures, there's 1.1 million landlines in North Korea or, to put it another way, five landlines to every 100 people. So, if you need to order pizza in the North Korea, plan, up, plan accordingly because you might have a lot of weight. Um, there were plans at foot in 2003 to expand the telephone coverage within North Korea, but in 2007, uh, the North Korean government decided that probably wasn't their best idea. Um, why is there a picture of Robert Redford apart from the fact that he's a very attractive man? Well, um, automated switching is only in use in North Korea in Pyongyang. In the capital, you have automated switching. Everywhere else, you have manual switches. Now, the automated switches that are actually in use are French. They're produced by Alcatel Lucent, and if you've ever tried to work with French technology, the North Koreans have a degree of my sympathy, shall we say. Um, if you want to make and receive phone calls outside of Pyongyang, it's quite complicated and quite uh, problematic. In as much as, as well as needing a little bloke to run down to the switching station and rearrange the plugs, you also typically will be using hand-framed phones. So instead of actually just picking up a receiver, dialing a number, that number going through, what actually happens is you pick up the phone, you crank the phone, dial the number, Send the guy down to the switching station, we go from that, and then eventually you might get to talk to someone, but possibly. Um, I'll go into telecoms in a bit more detail, but yeah, the fact that this is a major, credible force to be considered with regards to information warfare is a little bit sketchy when it takes them about half an hour to make a phone call. So, uh, apart from Kung Yang, um, it's possible for an elite. <coughs> or an elect elite to access the internet, kind of. In uh, 2005, there was an organisation called Rank All Air, an organisation called Rank, that do some amazing work basically helping North Korean dissidents uh, have the brain to get the book out of North Korea. And what they did is they did an investigation into uh, the internet cafes that were around in North Korea. Uh, that one there is called the Information Technology Store. Good name, the internet cafe. It's brave as much that had they been caught with cameras, they would almost certainly have been fucked up beyond belief. You know, you don't spy on North Korea and get away with it. Um, that right there is the inside of the information technology store, and as you can see, it's very salubrious as much as you get to some plastic garden chairs. And uh, there's also a nice little man that comes around looking over your shoulder and making sure you're actually looking at the internet properly. Um, the IT, I'd say the IT, uh, IT store uh, is one of the very few, or was one of the very few states in the internet caps. Um, apparently, there are only two, or were only two. Um, it was opened in 2005, and um, it reportedly charged uh, 20,000 won per month for access. Now, when you consider that the average monthly salary is 3,000 won, you know, it's 17,000 won more than most people earn or was. Um, as well as uh, the information technology store, you also have a place called uh, the Internet PC Ring. That was set up in 2002 by a guy called Kim Boon Yoon, uh, who also runs HuNet.com. Uh, why is that interesting? Because he was initially employed by the North Koreans to set up the North Korea version of Betfair. Well, it was, the North Koreans said, okay, online companies, you know, useful, a uh, good way to get tax free income, let's do that. So they did, uh, it didn't work, but you know, they tried it. Uh, that allegedly charged about $10 an hour, which is the equivalent of a fortnight's wage. So for a fortnight of your, of your wages, you, can use, or you could use the internet for an hour, which is surprisingly enough why it was more popular with tourists. So I wonder what was installed on them. Um, according to uh, both the AP news agency and Reuters, in 2007, both of those institutions were shut down because they were perceived as a threat. Um, 
that's why they were closed. So, incidentally, I am using notes because I can't keep this shit in my head. So, apart from dial-up connections to China, uh, the internet and DPRK can also be accessed by satellite uplinks. Um, as well as accessing Pyongyang, e.g. the intranet, uh, by a dial-up service in China, there's also a dial-up service in Germany. Uh, they're controlled by a guy called Jan Holtzman, we'll talk about a bit more later on, but he's a lovely human being. Um, but yeah, back to satellites, they're apparently in use in a number of tourist-friendly hotels. Um, quite what's meant by tourist-friendly, I don't actually know. I presume that means that your rooms are heavily booked but clean. Um, nobody, the important thing is that nobody for sure knows how many North Koreans can use the internet, how they use the internet, and what they do when they do. The likelihood is that very few do, and those that do are very, very regulated in terms of what they can do. You know, a repressive, fucked up dictatorship does not like to give open access to the internet to their population, which you know, could explain why what's trying to censor in the UK. So, why is there a big picture of a splash? Well, this is this is ties back to the satellite thing. Um, in 86, North Korea, with help from the French, joined Intelsat. Uh, basically, off the back of that, they managed to get a couple of satellites up above the Atlantic Ocean, um, which allowed for um, various car carrier signals, most of which were utilised for um, TV as opposed to comms. Um, in 2001, um, DPRK actually joined Intelstat as their own member, as their own member country, which is quite interesting. And basically, what they do is they rely on satellite things from uh, the French and various other people to connect to both Japan and the United States. Um, in, since the 80s, uh, the North Koreans have been working on their own internal orbiting satellite program, just because you know they don't like being relying on relying on weird foreigners. Um, they claimed in March last year to have successfully launched their first orbiting satellite, which is kind of true, they launched it. But according to the US and the South Koreans, who obviously have got no agenda when it comes to North Korea, but also to the Russians, who haven't got an agenda, um, what happened was they launched it, but then it fell into the sea. So technically they were right, it's launched, but it's not orbiting because it sank. But you know, either way, they're, they're working on getting their own independent orbiting satellites there. As well as satellites, North Korea also had passed out a number of international, international direct dialing lines. In 1990, they set up three direct lines to, Japan, to, to the Japanese. In 1995, that late, there was a direct line to the US installed by the lovely, lovely people at AT&T. So, you know, AT&T had problems with 4chan, but not apparently with North Korea. Uh, 2000, um, they had a total of 56 IDD lines, uh, most of which were ran through three other party relays, or third country relays, which raises all kinds of interesting concepts about the monitoring of IDD calls, which could explain why in 2008, um, all but about two, one to the US, one to Japan, of the IDD connections were disabled by the North Korean government. So, with regard to the telephone structure, basically, uh, it's very, very fucked up. Um, the only way to call North Korea uh, from outside of North Korea is to speak to an operator. Basically, you've got two phone numbers. Um, you've got, in memory serves, uh, if you're in North Korea and you wanted to phone the North Korean embassy, you dial 02-382-7980. If you're outside of North Korea, um, it's 050-2381-7980. And that delineation basically says, that you first speak to an operator who says, why are you phoning North Korea? Um, as a couple of GSM networks, um, there's the Sunnet network, which basically was talked about and kind of implemented and no longer works. And there's also the Coralink 3D network, which is installed in Pyongyang, which actually does work. Um, as part of doing this talk, um, I considered war dialing North Korea, so I thought it might be funny. 
Um, the minor problem I have with that is um, there have been reports, uh, quite well published reports by Human Rights Watch, that if you are a North Korean and you receive a call from Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or even somewhere else in North Korea, you're fine. If, as a North Korean, you receive a call from the UK, from probably a drunk Yorkshire and going, no, no, what do you do? Then you get shot because you know why you're speaking to a foreign national. Now, although I'm interested in research, although I'm interested in finding out what the hell's going on, the concept of getting lots and lots of people shot just to find out is not that attractive. <coughs> so, parallel. Uh, 2008, um, an Egyptian company called Roscon uh, set up a GSM network in Pyongyang. <coughs> That's kind of interesting as much as the Roscon built hotels. Um, as well as building hotels, they apparently built reliable uh, GSM networks, which is good of them. Um, they did uh, the GSM network for Pakistan back in, I think it was 2006. And the same 2008 set one in North Korea. Um, it only works in Pyongyang. If you're outside of the state capital, it doesn't work. So therefore, not actually a full GSM network, is it, boys? Um, but their operational data that I can find is interesting in as much that their subscribers started off with like a thousand and then within what a year that shot up to 91,000 that's like the biggest take up rate in fucking history and if it's accurate then Oroscom are doing really good business um, as well as um, Oroscom doing a bit of really good business um, the other major shareholder in current link is uh, the North Korean government, they're 25%, which is nice, you know, because they have big say. Um, they, can open, they can access uh, the state-run internet, they can access Pyongyang using a mobile browser, but in terms of shelling that out and going anywhere decent, not a chance. Uh, I can't find that many details on Korea Link and how it works. Uh, I have got the numbers you need to dial to access subscribers' phones, which again I've not done. And what I also found online was, uh, as part of the promo material for Corolla Link, uh, the North Koreans pushed out a video about it, as did the Roscon saying, well, they could not create go up. And that, I believe, is a network diagram that may be relevant. Shit screenshot, uh, the reason why I say it may be relevant is it's on local host, so probably not. But if anybody's got any image enhancement software, let me know, get me that, because I want to know what that says. So, moving on. Uh, North Korea is not without technical institutions, uh, most famous of which is the Korean Computer Center, which is that place there. Uh, that's just outside Pyongyang, and it was founded in 1990. Um, in recent years, it's been supplemented by a number of branch offices. Um, there's one in the United Arab, Arab Emirates, there's one in China, and there's one in Syria. What do those things all have in common? They're all members of the Axis of Evil. There's also a branch office in Germany. So, Germany may well be involved in the Axis of Evil. I'm British, I'm saying nothing. But you know, it's about the interest. Uh, now, the one in um, Germany is, head, is headed by that guy there, called Jan Boltzmann, lovely looking gentleman. Uh, basically, yay, phone call, go away. Thank you. Never use your phone as your watch. Um, publicly, it's a research institute, that's what they do. Uh, they've also developed a range of software that's known about, and it's also got a number of companies that actively trade from its premises. Um, there's also the Pyongyang Informatics Centre, which is set up in 86, which I believe is our place there. I'm hoping that that photo was taken in 1986, because if the North Koreans are still using 486s, they're fucked. Um, but yeah, with regards to the branch office in Berlin, basically what happened was, and this is the best business scheme ever, and why I wasn't involved in this, I don't know, but basically what happened is a North Korean said, okay, you're from a semi-friendly state, because you used to have been East Germany, didn't you, Mr. Holton? You mean, yes, I did. They said, okay, here's a million dollars, what can we have? And this is so fucking canny. You basically said, well, for a million dollars, um, I can give you nine servers, that day, yeah? And they went, oh, all right. So, you know, the best de business deal ever. A million dollars for nine servers. The guy is a fucking criminal genius. <laughs> so, what do North Koreans make? Well, 
uh, that produced apparently a number of public software from XEC. You've got a search engine component per Pyongyang. I uh, don't know how it works, but there you go. You've also got a writing program, which is fairly interesting. You've got a food study program, which is awesome considering that, you know, there's mass starvation in North Korea. You might not have anything to eat, but here's what a radish looks like. Um, <laughs> You also have uh, their own independent Linux distribution, or Bright Star, um, or Red Star, I should say. Um, in February this year, a Russian guy called Ashen Rush uh, published details of Red Star. How did a Russian guy get hold of it? Well, uh, Kim Il Sung University in, not in Pyongyang has a lot of foreign students, usually from places like Russia. There aren't too many people from Oxford that go, where shall I go next? Oh, I know. Uh, doesn't happen. But basically, it up a uh, uh, North Korean market for the equivalent of $5, which is a shitload of money if you're a North Korean. Not only you've got to spend a shitload of money on it, but you know you haven't got a computer to run it on anyway. But you know, they're selling free software, so go there. Um, but the best part about it, it's, a Debian, it's got a Debian base, but the best part is a readme file, which direct quote, uh, apparently Kim Jong-il said to the North Koreans, you must create a system based on the Linux kernel in our Korean style. I don't know what that is, but you know, it might be, it might be a bit like monkey style or dragon style or something, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing about that is that, to my mind, it makes Kim Jong Il sound a bit like a Linux fan. So if you run a Linux user screen and Kim Jong Il shows up, don't be too surprised, he's into Linux. Um, apparently, uh, the OS in question isn't that stable or isn't that defined. So, you know, it's completely unlike every other community distribution that's out there. But, you know, it's, it's you know, usable-ish. Um, as well as producing software independently, KCC has also got a number of foreign companies based on the site. Um, one of the most interesting ones is a company called Nosotech. Uh, Nosotech was set up in 2008 by a guy called Volga Elisa, again, a German, would notice it in a pattern. Uh, but yeah, he set that up in 2008, uh, basically to provide outsourced software, uh, outsourced software services from North Korea. So basically, if you need coding done on the cheap, go to North Korea. You know, it's especially useful in as much that North Koreans get paid nothing. And you know, if they fuck up, they get shot. So you know, slavery is awesome. <laughs> Um, as you can see from the photo I managed to off, um, from 2009, they were still using Windows XP, so completely unlike every other corporate in the world. So, well as Nostra Tech, there's a number of other companies. You've got um, DHL have got a branch office there. Um, Orange, um, I believe, have a branch office there because they were first to pitch on the GSM stuff, and as much as they're French, so you know, the Koreans like the French. Uh, there's also um, an Italian law company for some reason, I don't know why, a couple of Dutch shipping companies, and more interestingly of all, there's a Swiss based company uh, called Data Activity. What Data Activity did, clue is in the name, they do data processing. Who do they do data processing for? Well, I hear you ask. Well, they do data processing for banks, which you know, is an awesome idea. You know? You're worried about fishers, you're worried about your credit card details being used for malicious purposes. Or criminal purposes. I know. Why don't we send your credit card details to North Korea? That'll be fine. Um, in the UK, um, the telephone service, like everything else, um, is provided by British Telecom for the North Korean ambassador. There's his telephone number. If you want to ring him up, you can. I recommend you do. His secretary is sick of me. Um, we've had many conversations, most of which have ended in her telling me to fuck off. But, you know, they obviously have a pronounced and detailed um, use of technology in the much that the uh, email address for the North Korean ambassador is from btinternet.com. So, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of North Korean ambassador. That's hotmail.com. No, so they're clearly on it. Um, if you want to go around to the North Korean ambassador's house, you can. There it is. Um, he's based in Ealing, which is like a residential suburb in London and lives next to a dentist who's a lovely guy. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's sort of on a residential street in the middle of a London suburb. The only way you can tell it's not for him and see is because he's got a flag, which is going to be a bit of a giveaway. 
Interestingly, he also drives a Mercedes. Okay, German. <laughs> um, the good thing about that is um, North Korea doesn't allow individuals to own cars because you know it's a deeply capitalist thing having a car. But you know, apparently, if you're North Korean ambassador, you can drive a car. That's fine. And he's obviously got a slight ego problem in the People's Republic of Korea, number one diplomat, and number two, I'm the best diplomat. Yes, I am. Well, you know, go, go see him. Go see him. So, quick timeline. The most interesting thing about that is that, you know, there's only so many hours you can fucking use. I am going to shell that out and expand it a bit, but, you know, the most important thing on that one is in the 80s, they set up a program for orbiting satellites, and in 2009, their orbiting satellite launched and didn't crash, which is quite funny. I am going to try and expand it out to say, but, you know, there's only really so, so much you can do with arrows. So, the second bit, which is much more interesting, I promise you. Uh, what I'm going to try and do in this bit is present some of my asinine childish research and hopefully debunk a few myths about North Korea. Uh, that, by the way, is the North Korean power grid. If you've never seen it before, good, neither of the North Koreans because the power goes down pretty much every five minutes in North Korea. So, I'd like to begin with something called the Mystery of the Universe. Why is there a picture of a cat dressed like a chicken? Not, because, not for any logical reason, largely because if your talk is shit, put in a picture of a cat because people will be confused and go, ah. Oh. <laughs> um, so, in May of 2009, a guy called uh, Major Steve Sim, attached to the US Army, wrote a paper. In case you didn't get that, there is a guy called Major Sim that works for the US Army. Nobody sees the fucking irony in that. But yeah, he wrote a paper which was entitled The Cyber Threat Posed by North Korea and China to South Korea and US False History. So, you know, as well as having a ridiculous name that makes him sound a bit like a porn star, Major Sin is not good at writing titles. Um, in it, he outlines a military unit called Unit 121 that apparently um, consists of a number of individuals that are solely dedicated to information warfare activities. Interestingly, the source for this comes from the Yonhap News Agency. For those of you who are familiar with the YNA, the YNA basically is the South Korean government-funded news agency. You know, they're a bit like the BBC, but more tightly regulated if you can believe such a thing is even fucking possible. Um, they basically interviewed an anonymous source. As well as that, there's also an article which was cited called Inside the Unit 121. Notice that word, inside. So whoever wrote that clearly did and knew all about it. That was published in a section called Defense Tech, which for those of you who are familiar with it, is basically monster.com does military jobs and news about new paper killing machines. Fascinating if you're into paper killing machines. Um, that came out in 2007. So what is you? Well, apparently, um, it consists of 17,000 personnel, which is an awful lot of people who are interested in information warfare and attacking computers. Um, and it's situated in the KCC, which is that building there. They apparently have 17,000 hackers in there, which is pretty fucking impressive. You know, they may work shifts or they may just be really fucking small. So, um, apparently, according to the article in question, they possess moderately advanced distributed denial of service capabilities with moderate virus and co uh, malicious code capabilities. So there's 17,000 people working on one site and they're only moderately good? What the fuck are they doing? You know, if you have 17,000 people and you are only writing moderately good code, you suck. So, um, they're apparently responsible for attacking the West and generally being the technical ninjas on behalf of Kim Jong-il. If, if the deal leader gets pissed off, he sets his boys on them. Sadly, um, there's not particularly independent sources, and I couldn't find any other credible mention of Unit 121 other than with the author of the piece, Independent Tech, who's a nice guy called Kevin Cole. So, I sent him an email because I have no life. And basically said, I'm giving a talk about North Korea. You've said they pose a credible threat. You've said there's 17,000 Uber hackers. Can I have some proof? You know, attribution, 
you know, credible journalism, even if, it's, even if it's just to say, it come from an anonymous source, if I tell you quite who they are, they will get shot in the face. I don't know if I can accept that. Apparently, um, I pissed him off. Um, and as much as the tone of the email put him off. Sorry, you're a journalist, deal with a bitch. Um, I was also told to Google North Korea's Unit 121, which is weirdly what I did to fucking find him in the first place. Um, he also asked me to look at the attribution of the July 4th cyber attacks on the US South Korea, yada, yada, yada. Um, now, other than that, Kevin wasn't prepared to speak to me because the information was classified, which is a great way of getting out of actually having to have any journalistic attribution whatsoever. But I, I wrote him back again, and it was like, okay, Look, sorry to annoy you, you're probably a very important man that's dealing with secret James Bond shit that a mere civilian like me needs not to know about. He then told me to look at Major Sin, which is the name, so I love that name, Major Sin. Now, that's quite interesting in the bush that that's basically what I refer to as a clusterfuck. Major Sin says, look over here. Great, uh, Kevin Collins says, look at Major Sin. And, you know, there's no attribution about them themselves. He also told me to get in touch with MI5. Now, Kevin, bless his little consorts, is meant to be a cyber warfare expert. This is what he does. He gathers and utilizes information about enemy competence. Maybe then, Kevin, you should know that MI5 deal with domestic fucking surveillance. So if I ask them questions about North Korea, they'll tell me to fuck off. Who I should be contacting is MI6. Close, but you know. Okay. Um, I then sent an email saying, are you sure of MI5? Really? Um, are you sure about this Unit 121 thing? He then decided that Unit 121 could have actually been. He could have misheard. It could be Unit 110, or it could be Unit 101. At which point, I suggested that Unit 121 might exist in Room 101. At which point, he told me to fuck off. <laughs> I said, OK, I will fuck off, but thank you very much. If you're going to be a journalist, have, you know, attributable information. Otherwise, I'll make you look like a cunt internationally. So, apparently, there is a point here. And my point is that the only sources about this really terrifying technical unit that's dedicated to destroying the West and our values and our computers, the only sources are obfuscated, anonymous, or classified. But yet, it's presented as fact. Now, the most interesting thing about this is the journalist in question who first broke this story as a DMD of a company called Techno Analytics. What do Techno Analytics do, Mike? Well, they provide cyber war training and advice, so he clearly has no agenda at all. Um, Kevin also came up, interesting, with the definition of cyber terrorism, not, not the actual words, because words are hard, but the definition. Um, he's also presented to the US Congress at about five times, so he's, he's very much an expert. You know, as much that he gets to speak to the US con uh, the Congress. Problem is, he can't actually source any of his allegations publicly. So, on that basis, I call bullshit. Uh, that interestingly is the, is the technology site, which as you can see, is very lean because it uses frames. Uh, I've also managed to check out some of their cyber warfare training, and it's fucking hilarious. It is literally like, if you, ha if you have a classified network and you're approached by somebody with a funny accent, don't tell them about your network because they could be a spy. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. I would not have known. Now, just to clarify, I'll publicly admit, on record, that I'm completely wrong. If Kevin can come to me and say, here is my evidence, stop calling me a dick, I will stop calling him a dick and I will wear a little t-shirt saying, Kevin's ace. I'm sorry, please hit me. Um, until he actually does that, I am calling bullshit though, because it is. Um, the point is though, not to attack a particular expert, even one as vacuous as Kevin, but to suggest that if you're going to make a claim, attribute it, have some degree of fucking tangible proof and evidence. Um, if anybody wants the mail chain between me and Kevin, I'll provide that, because I believe in sourcing what I'm fucking saying, even though I'm not a journalist. Um, which leads me to my next point. As I'm sure you're aware, Gregory Evans, the number one hacker in the world. Gregory knows everything about everything, especially how to plagiarize other people's work. Kevin Coleman, the 
was from one cyber war expert. He knows everything there is to know about cyber war, apart from fucking attribution. So, this brings me neatly up to The Economist. Um, in July this year, The Economist, which is run by Pearson International, that also are the same people that do the Financial Times, so kind of should know what they're doing with regards to journalism, published a couple of articles on cyber war, um, and cyber war, war in the fifth dimension, which makes it sound awesome. As you can see by the title, uh, by the front uh, cover, non-contentious images, it was obviously a very considered response, and you know, got to be deep and meaningful journalism. In there, they made a couple of claims. Apparently, cyberspace, instead of interesting word, cyberspace, fuck okay, it, we're in 92. Uh, but no, apparently cyberspace has become the fifth domain of warfare, after land, sea, air, and space. When did we start fighting in fucking space? Okay, Star, Star, I've seen Star Trek, they fight in space there. There's a Star Wars program on walls, but there's no fighting in space unless you're in a sci-fi film. So, I'm not sure when cyberspace, wherever that is, became the fifth domain of warfare, but apparently it's happened. And the most interesting point is, in their leader column, they call for a lot could be achieved between greater cooperation between governments and the private sector. Awesome. I see where this is going. To create panic about an unknown threat, or a known threat, namely North Korea, and then say, okay, how can we regulate? Oh, I know. Governments and private sector organisations can start working, working together. Nothing to worry about that. That'll work really well. Um, the interesting point about that is they make a lot of references to cyber weaponry, which sounds fucking awesome. But what they actually mean by that is scripts. Now, if you make scripts legal, then you know, research becomes legal. This is particularly pertinent in the UK, and as much as uh, at the moment we've got something that's gone through the um, Parliamentary process in the Jets of the House of Lords, who are like the ultimate decision makers in the UK, uh, which basically is an update to our um, anti computer misuse um, uh, legal documentation, namely the Computer Misuse Act, which basically says if you create something or publish something which is then used as information to attack a computer system, you are culpable of an offence. Which basically means if you write a research paper, or give a talk, or publish a spoil, you possibly go to jail. Awesome way of dealing with security there, guys. Um, but anyway, that was something there, that's just a secondary point. Um, third thing I said, which caught my notice, was one response to the growing threat to the military. Iran claims to have the world's, the world's second largest cyber army, which is fucking impressive when you look at the military spend of Iran. You know, it pales into insignificance next to the US, which spent like billions upon billions upon billions, and Iran spends about 20 pounds. Um, but you know, they're spending it wisely. Um, Russia, Israel, and North Korea both have it to their own. Russia and Israel? Yeah, probably. North Korea? How the fuck? They don't have the internet. But, you know, okay, apparently they've got cyber arm, but no internet. But again, there's questions of attribution. Where did this information come from? Who's providing the information, etc., etc. Which brings me to my next point, which was to send Pearson uh, an email. Again, because I have no fucking life. The um, thing with Pearson is they don't have a named editor. They also have, don't have named journalists, which is really interesting. They've done that because, you know, um, they'll be impartial if nobody's named. Bollocks. If nobody's named, I don't know who they are, which means I don't know what their agenda is, which means I don't know whether Kevin Coleman wrote these pieces or not. But anyway, uh, they have no editorial contact, so I have to get in touch with PR, which is always fun. I said, okay, read the articles, loved them, great work, what's the attribution? As of yet, I've not heard anything back, which is not that surprising, because you know, they're Pearson International and they're proper journalists, okay? Which brings me down this point, namely, what the fuck is going on? Well, uh, it's a very, very simple theory that I have. That basically, you make a number of unfounded uh, number of unfounded claims. You state something which nobody can prove or disprove. If all the sources for the information are classified, you can't prove it. You also can't disprove it. Um, this is what happened with the 2007 piece on Unit 121. That then made press. You then reinforce those claims in a credible publication. Like, like The Economist, like The Financial Times. That obviously makes more press. If those rumours are unfounded, or maybe even founded, panic spreads. 
and therefore people's spending power increases. Governments go, oh fuck, we've got to sell up a cyber command now and spend billions of taxpayers' money on it. And you know, if you work with techno analytics or Blackwater or whoever, you get billions of dollars of funding for building secure computers. Or not, I suppose, maybe. Can't be cynical, that might be what's going on. So, <laughs> point is, um, I do call bullshit on the economies, the same way I call bullshit on Kevin Cole. And as much that um, the articles in there are based on unverified anonymous sources, which is box. If you're making a claim, prove it. It's very, very simple, you know? So, brings me on to Charlie Miller. Now, I have no issue with Charlie Miller. I think he's one of the most talented researchers in the world. This is a guy that's won the Cansec West Home to Home competition about five years straight. He's a fucking clever guy. So I don't want to pick on him. Especially don't want to pick on him as he used to work for the NSA. So probably knows people that can kill me with a fucking spoon. But I'm going to slightly pick on him and hope that nobody has a spoon. Um, earlier this year, in August in fact, he presented a dev novel. And did a talk called Kim Jong-il Me, How to Build a Cyber Army to Attack the US. Not a contentious title there at all, Charlie. Um, so, because I was interested in North Korea, been interested in North Korea for a while, I decided to have a read. Now, um, interesting thing about North Korea before we go any further. North Korea has this amazing thing called Jush. Jush is but Jush. Jush, no, that's something else. Uh, Jush is basically an ideology that lies at the heart of North Korea government and the North Korean state. Um, it was conceived by Kim Il-sung after he'd come up the mountain and gone down the mountain and decided he was going to leave Korea out of the darkness of capitalist oppression. And basically it consists of a number of parts. Um, independence in politics, self-sustenance in the economy, and self-defense is national in its national defense. So basically, we're North Korea, we don't want anything to do with you. If you fall with us, we'll do something. We may involve missiles, we don't have. Um, its central premise, though, is they don't like dealing with external third parties, largely because external third parties could contaminate the minds of the North Koreans and turn them against them. We have a new person in charge. Um, it's not only incorporated in state ideology, but also in military policy. Uh, the fact that it's part of core North Korean military policy, e.g., very closed, not part of us, is actually worth remembering when considering the Charlie Miller thing. Oh, interesting, the best thing about this, um, our Jewish poll, is it's really, really pro-feminist. It's awesome. Best quote ever. Man is the master of everything and decides everything. Awesome. <laughs> if I can convince my girlfriend of that, I will die a fucking happy man. So, um, what did Charlie say? Um, well, basically, he began his talk by outlining, outlining the North Korean military spending. He puts that figure at, what, uh, 5 billion? Uh, which is interesting considering the most reliable estimates put the military spending of the US on 703 billion. Let's look at that again. North Korea, 5 billion. US, 703 billion. Okay, not the US has more money. Um, now, according to the Stockholm International Peach Research Institution, we're from Sweden. He's right. Um, however, according to an article published in the Asian, Asian Chronicle in July, he's wrong. A guy called John Pfeffer, who basically works for the Institute of Policy Studies, which is like a left-leaning think tank in America. Uh, he's got guys like Noam Chomsky on the senior scholars. He puts the military spending of North Korea at about half a billion. So, you know, five billion, half a billion, yeah. yeah. Now, the accountant can properly explain it, but you know, nobody, again, it's like the technology. Nobody's, nobody's sure how much North Koreans are spending on tech. Nobody's sure how much they're spending on military. No fucking knows. You know, you can you can have a guess, but you know. But you know, apparently, according to Charlie, uh, if you're North Korea, Korea, you can win a cyber war in inverted fucking commas uh, for only the bargain basement price of forty-nine million dollars. Now. How do you intend to do it? How, how can you do that? Well, really simply, what you do is you get bot end developers, you get bot herders, you get exploit developers, you get webmasters, you get researchers, you get managers, you get personnel that you can put in power, in power plants, you get spies, you get, you get 
lots and lots of people together, all with specialist skills, and then you pay them. Um, minor problem with that is that's A, employing external expertise, which North Koreans may or may not want to do because of all Jewish ideology. But, okay, everybody in this room has a job or hopes a job in security. Yeah? If I am offered, uh, top, Charlie's top story, by the way, is 100,000 US. If I am offered 100,000 US by a Russian mobster, I will not do any work for them because they may shoot you if you fuck up. If the, if the North Koreans offered me £100,000, I wouldn't take the money on the offer, because if I fuck up, they will shoot me in the face. So, you know, there aren't so many people that will, I guess, be willing to risk getting shot in the face for, like, a hundred grand a year. But, um, basically, what Charlie is talking about is that the North Koreans need to set up their own mini version of the US Cyber Command. Which, you know, in case you don't know, it's the wonderful, wonderful tax rate in the US economy. Um, as I say, apparently, if you get 592 people, you can create Uber Ode and own power stations. A um, couple of problems, uh, which he clearly hasn't considered. Um, firstly, in the case of what he's talking about, calls for external recruitment. If you're, a, if you're a, a country that doesn't believe in external experts, you're probably not going to hire 592 of them. It also calls for the insertion of personnel, remotely managed personnel, it comes to that. God knows how they're meant to remotely fucking manage them as they can't even send email. But, you know, it calls for the insertion of those people into hard targets, so power plants, and, you know, defence institutions. So, you know, North Korean spies suddenly get jobs in the US government. I mean, why not? The Russian did it. Um, recruiting those people is a bitch, though. You know, hiring 592 top flight researchers for only a grand each is really fucking hard. It's difficult. Um, the final point is why the fuck would anybody do that? Um, if North Korea, as proposed by Charlie, went after the car routers, went after the car carriers, went after the keynotes, um, they cause absolute fucking chaos. But why? All the third party relationships with the French, etc., and the Germans would instantly be severed. Nobody's going to act as a carrier network, somebody's going to attack the network. It's not going to fucking happen. Um, not only that, if you are a small nation and your military spending is five billion, you're not going to pick on the biggest people in the fucking playground because you know they'll fuck you up. You know, it's Makes no sense. But anyway, leaves me to my point that people need to keep calm and carry on. Is, it, is the attacks outlined by Charlie possible? Yeah. Will it actually happen? Maybe. Is it possible I may walk up to a shipping container and find it full of used £20 notes? Maybe. Is it actually going to happen? Probably fucking not. <laughs> um, it's a great talk, though. It's worth reading. Um, but, you know. Because of what it calls for, which is infrastructure, staff management, and cash, and time, it's probably never going to fuck and happen. That brings me to my next point. Um, Kevin called and told me to check out the July 4th cyber attacks. Actually, Kevin, you're wrong, they started on July 4th first. Again, we're down with the confusion between days, but you know, hey, whatever, you can't count. Um, what happened there is there are a number of key targets in the sta states, like the Treasury Department, the state, uh, the state Department, the White House, that were attacked. Um, as well as 25 South Korean banks. Um, now, Korean Sir um, requested a Vietnamese company called Backhoe Internet Security. It's an amazing work on this to actually investigate what was going on. Meanwhile, in America, uh, a guy called Peter Hoekstra, who's like a Republican, uh, Republican House of Commons, what is a Republican, but was at the time in the House Intelligence Committee, basically said, It's North Korea that's done it. I have proof um, and everything. Uh, my problem with that is the same guy that in 2006 said that we have found WMDs in Iraq. So, you know, not the most credible or reliable of experts, shall we say. Especially seeing as, you know, I'm from the UK where we kind of were a little bit resistant to the war in Iraq. So if WMDs have been found, we'd have quite liked to know. Uh, but anyway, um, what actually happened? Well, Batcoa did some great work. And they basically found a remote, um, remote command and control servers were situated in Brighton, which was VPN back to a CNC server in Miami. 
Now, my geography is a bit flaky, but Brighton's on the south, uh, southwest coast of uh, the UK, and Miami, I believe, is on the coast of America. Now, as far as I know, neither of those two locations are in North Korea. I mean, I could be wrong. It could have happened. The world could have moved around a bit. Um, the IPs in question belong to a company called Digital Broadcast, who make like set boxes and shit. And the official statements um, basically say that uh, there was malware, but we don't know what malware was involved. There's about 160,000 bots that were involved there, uh, which were spread over 74 countries. Again, not North Korea, but you know, 74 countries, not one. Um, yes, the malware was big. Oh, sorry, the bot was big, but the malware was The malware was now big in North Latin. Basically, it was based on a 2004 release of ID, which was kind of cobbled together and, you know, made to do its thing. Made no attempt to obfuscate itself, made no attempt, uh, no attempt to evade AB, which, you know, if you're employed by the North Korean military to make this code, maybe you need to make this code a bit better, just a lot. But, um, yeah, basically, um, According to a number of sources out there, the most namely Project Eric Progus, and the guys who worked on that, it probably wasn't North Koreans. But you know, blaming the North Koreans is great. Um, in 2004, there's a guy called Lieutenant General Sung Yung Yong of South Korea's Defense Security Council that basically said that the North Koreans had the same technical capabilities as the CIA. Which, okay, I'm confused now. According to Kevin and his ilk, they only have moderate abilities. The 17,000 only have moderate abilities. So that means that the CIA are only moderately good at computing. Ha! Awesome. Um, now, that obviously got disputed instantly by a number of people, most of which may have been affiliated with the CIA, but like, we know more than them. Fuck off. We spent years and years and years of money on this shit. We know more. Um, but, you know, I can understand why the confusion comes in. Um, in as much as uh, a guy called Kuji, um, otherwise known as Matthew Bevan, was also called by the South Koreans to be North Korea, because you know, he had a vaguely sounding North Korean name. And you know, he was attacking things like US Air Force, Lockheed, etc., etc., back in the day. Problem is, Kuji, or Matthew, is from Cardiff. Cardiff, again, is not in North Korea. You know, they get confused. Um, so, as another North Korean general that came out in June this year, that uh, basically said that the G20 summit that starts in November in Seoul would almost certainly be targeted by North Korea. Um, don't know quite how, but you know, uh, apparently they're going to conduct a massive cyber attack and create absolute havoc and destroy evidence. Now, based on the last G20 summit meeting in London, I'm guessing it's not just the North Koreans that are problems. I mean, there you can see our lovely, well-managed British police force being well-mannered and um, not, you know, interfering with people's democratic rights to process or protest at all. You know, especially this guy down at the bottom, who's in Tomlinson, who was basically a newspaper seller, who was walking home, had nothing to do with the protest, and basically got thrown to the walking floor and died of a heart attack. So, you know, very democratic. You know, I love the G20 for this. <coughs> Um, most interesting thing about that, the guys that did it um, are still working for the British police, being as friendly as Oceans up there. So, you know, it's probably not just the North Koreans that have a fucking problem, is all I'm saying. So, brings me to my next point, the batshit crazy department. There is a theory going around at the moment, and this is one of my favourite theories about North Korea, by a long fucking way. Apparently, the Gulf oil spill was caused by North Korea. It wasn't caused by BP. You know, BP and their safety record of, you know, having an accident every second Tuesday wasn't there. It was North Korea. Basically, there's a lot of neocons out there um, that push this theory out. I've got the original URL if anybody wants it. Uh, but it made stuff like, um, where else did it make? Yeah, it made like um, EU Times and shit like that. So, you know, fairly credible journalists that are a bit like the weekly world news. But the theory goes, there are two theories. One. North Korea borrowed, a, uh, borrowed a, a cargo vessel from Cuba, um, drove it across US waters to, you know, just outside the oil rig, um, torpedoed the oil rig, because apparently you get torpedoes on a fucking cargo vessel, and the oil rig is Theory two, which is just as fucking mental, 
is there was a suicide squad, awesome phraseology, not mine, but theirs, you know, which were probably akin to the ones found in Monty Piper's life, Brian. No, people's Democratic Republic of Suicide Squad. They got into a submarine. Not just any submarine. This submarine, the submarine in question, was stealth. Pure stealth. Absolutely resistant to every known fucking radar known to man. They're technically invisible. North Korea has a suicide squad and an invisible submarine. They're like Wonder Woman and shit. She had an invisible plane, they've got an invisible submarine. And again, Suicide Squad went through US waters, you know, US Coast Guard was obviously having lunch or something at the time, and plowed it into the oil platform. Why did they do this? Because the oil platform was made in South Korea, which you know, is a bit odd. So, so, so because something's made in South Korea, you drive an invisible submarine into it. Okay? Seems a bit over the top. So, uh, as part of this research, I actually wanted to see what infrastructure I could find. Um, North Korea's got an IP block, but it's got nothing in it. We saw something blip on it once. Um, by, the, by the time we got around to actually having a look what blipped it, fucked off. So I don't know if they were doing some dark magic or anything. It just, oh look, this shit, I'm like, go, go, let's see the other shit, always gone. Yeah, so there is an IP block, but it appears to be completely fucking in the most of the time. However, um, there are a number of servers that are externally available that are associated with North Korea. They use a lot of propaganda sites. Um, so I've got another look at it. And now, researchers say there's about 13, oh sorry, 30 of them. I found about 20 that are still alive. Uh, which are there. That for some of them have got some fucking awesome names, which again sound incredibly Python esque, like, you know, the Anti Imperialist National Democratic Front of Judea. They have some awesome name instructions. Um, but, you know, there, there are lots of pro-North Korea, pro jewish isn't Kim Jong-il awesome, not a wee lunatic sites. Um, I have a look at them. Interestingly, where do you think most of the servers are located? You would think China. You would think United Arab Emirates. You would think scary places that, you know, are out to destroy the capitalist West. Now, uh, Germany has the most. <laughs> um, Japan has the next most. And the US only has a mere measly tip. But you know, these are servers that are not located in China so much, but in Germany. Again, those will be the nine servers that were sold by yeah, Walton, I'm guessing. How do they break down? Well, um, most of them are using deprecated versions of Apache, some are using deprecated versions of US. But Kim clearly loves open source software. He likes Nix, he likes Apache. He has a lot of users with I'm fucking sure of it. So, uh, what did I find out? Well, I didn't find out that much because we have this thing called computer issues, so which means if I breach it, I go to jail. Uh, but the oldest iteration of iOS was 5. The oldest iteration of Apache was about 20 years old. Um, over half the sites had FTP open, and FTP that looks to be fairly trivial to brute force. Most of the software was deprecated, and a couple looked, and I emphasize the word looked to have trivialated pure false DBs. Um, the most interesting on all those sites was a really scary looking Java environment that wanted to do some very weird shit that I thought about it deep compiling and then got scared of and ran away. But you know, I wasn't brave enough, you may be. Um, more interestingly as well, there's this thing called Pape 2, which was on the official careerdpr.com uh, look at what it was on the awesome main site. Which also means WordPress. So Kim loves Apache, Linux, and WordPress, which is nice to him. Now, there's no mention of this Peg2 thing anywhere. Uh, but for those that don't know what Peg2 is, Peg2 is basically, back in the 50s, Kim Jong uh, Kim Il sung said, okay, this capitalism thing that's pissing me off, went up a mountain called Peg2, had a little bit of a thing, like Moses or some shit, and then came down Mount Peg2 and said, okay, we're going to be North Korea. So it's kind of a big deal for him from a historical point of view. Um, as I say, not mentioned fucking everywhere. It looks like a bog standard CMS admin interface. Uh, might be blood laden, who knows? Um, as well as all that, um, in 2009, North Korea settled a Twitter account. A social networking dictatorship. Awesome. Um, Twitter didn't find that funny and so promptly suspended it. 
Um, August the 12th this year, um, the North Korean Media Agency, or Propaganda Department, as it's known to the rest of the world, uh, our nation, opened the camp on both Twitter and YouTube. The YouTube one is great because it's got some really mental North Korean kids TV programs, absolutely batshit insane. There's this like, little communist trolls dancing, dancing along going, Oh, good game, awesome, insane. But you know, in Korea, obviously. <laughs> um, they also have a, let's say, a Twitter account. It's all written in North Korean, so. Um, now, it's not clear who's actually updating these resources, whether it's coming from North Korea or elsewhere. My guess is that it's probably coming from Germany. Like, <coughs> sorry. I keep looking at the German here whilst I'm saying this, I feel really bad. And yeah, I'm British, so kind of. But yeah. Um, it's nice to see that North Koreans are using social media, though, which is kind of a misnomer when, they, when you consider what an evil, fucked up, repressive regime they actually are. Um, the main website for the Our Nation propaganda department, though, has a MySQL error on it, which is quite good. Um, don't ask me how I found that, it, was, it magically appeared in my browser instance. But yeah, uh, they are clearly top flight people that are working on this shit. Now, without performing a full thorough and incredibly fucking illegal audit of these servers. I don't know how secure or insecure they are. They look fairly dodgy now. As I say, they're running deprecated software, they seem to be vulnerable to a number of common attack vectors, they've got extraneous services coming out of the arse. Now, why is that? Is it because they're run by lunatics? Yes. Um, you know, because it's run by people in the West that think Kim, uh, Kim jong is awesome. Um, or you would suspect, because they're associated with the North Korean state and pro-North Korean state, that the North Koreans would have a bit of an import. Now, is it because the North Koreans have got limited technical skills, because they've got limited infrastructure and limited access to information, or are they doing double bluffing? They're like, look, we're really crap, we don't pose a threat, we can't even secure a country, go away now. I don't know, uh, but it is interesting when, you know, they've got 17,000 personnel in the KCC, and none of them know how to actually secure Apache. Bit weird. So, my point is, I have conclusions. Um, are we all doomed, fucked, and going to die? Um, no, probably not. Uh, North Korea's got a really, really tightly regulated system of ICT. It's also an incredibly poor country. It has very, very limited resources. I mean, back in the 90s, about four, about four billion people were starved to death because they ran out of food. Or rather because the North Korean folks were like, yeah, we're keeping the food, and the petrol, and the coal. <coughs> Off you go. I mean, it's like the Stalin's purging back in the 30s. You get rid of dissent, you get rid of um, problems with resources by getting rid of the population. You know, there is an evil little shit in charge over there, let us not forget. Is it credible that North Korea are thinking about information welfare? Very probably, because it's cheap. You need one guy, a computer, and the internet. Um, problem is, there is a huge skills gap there. So they may be trying to outsource work. And you know, Charlie Miller advertising for business, saying, I'll do it for 100 grand. Yeah, come this way. It's worth the MSA. Um, they may be looking to outsource. They're probably not going to outsource to anything other than a friendly state. One of the few friendly states that's actually associated with North Korea is China. China are not going to attack the US, because China owns the US. They have more US, war, uh, US borders than anybody in the world. So they're not going to attack their biggest customer using information warfare. They're just going to fuck with bombs, because that's easier. So, my point is, and this is the important salient point of this entire fucking talk, which has been nonsensical and clouded, is stop fucking worrying about digital armageddon. Start worrying about the human rights record in North Korea, which is in the fucking toilet. They regularly abuse their own population, the game of an evil little shit in a bad wig. That's fucked up. Whether or not they can DDoS the White House, I don't actually care about that. What I care about is the fact that they're screwing their own population whilst the world goes, they could come for us, they could kill our servers. Fuck you and your servers, start thinking about human rights. Now, there might be a lot to explore there. I've mentioned the Corolla link, I've mentioned the DSM network, so I've got no idea how the backbone works. If you feel brave, maybe it might be worth investigating. I'm not that fucking brave. So, 
Questions, comments, abuse, random suggestions, no cream, kidnapping squads, heavy objects. Awesome. Any questions? My, my question would be, why the hell did you get into this? <laughs> or how did you, like, why? Get into why or how? <laughs> Choose one, you're on that one! <laughs> now, basically, it's, my thing is, the Novka is a closed system. You know, it's referred to as the Thermic Kingdom, not right what's known about it, and what is known about it is largely effective. You know, they're coming together, the sky is falling, run away. Now, as I say, I'm interested in closed systems. My job is breaking closed systems. North Korea is a closed system. You can't get in there as a tourist. Well, you can. But what happens is they take you on the water, put you in a little map with free minders, and then drive you around specific locations. You can just see the statue of Kim il -sung. You go to a school where everybody's happy and well and smiling. You're the only fucking car on the road, by the way. Um, if you speak to a North Korean, they get shot. But, you know, it is closed. And that's what's interesting about it. The examination of closed systems is apparently what we should be interested in doing. That's, you know, why do what I did. And that's why North Korea. Plus, you know, I thought it might be funny to piss off a country for once. I've annoyed lots of vendors in my time, but pissing off a country sounded fun. And, you know, who better than North Korea? Because they have a wicked little shit. But that's how. And indeed, why? Oh shit, the German wants a microphone. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Have you looked at the KCC Europe IP range and, and infrastructure? Um, I've looked at the range. Uh, with regards to the infrastructure, now I haven't, because that would be very, very naughty indeed. Um, you can probably get away with having a gentle poke of, uh, shall we say, the public IPs. But the actual IP designation of the KCC, I would be right to do. It's in your town, you do it. Yeah, I just already thought to go by and see where they are located. <laughs> Yeah, you After we learn today how to look around buildings and get into it. <laughs> <laughs> then here is you, I'd have to buy an airfare. And I don't speak German, you know. All I can say is I'm sure to which doesn't work. Um, as far as I know, this German guy is making business with North Korea um, and running this KCC Europe. Um, they have all connections from the um, socialist part of Germany. Yeah. Um, and therefore they know, like, North Korean and... Um, there was a long um, newspaper interview with this German guy, um, like two pages in a newspaper. Was that, was that Holtzman or Elsa? No, know. this was Holtzman. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, if you were interested, I could provide you with some, like, yeah, yeah, very much so. write up. I want, I want to see his justification for dealing with a fucking box of repressive Stalinist regime. <laughs> that would be a fun read. <laughs> Basically what he said was like, it's a, it's a give and take, like North Korea is interested in like um, getting, making business, earning some, some money, some dollars or euros with like programming software or somehow, and um, he is interested in making money, <laughs> he has these old connections, and therefore he's doing it, that is based, the baseline what he said in the interview. Awesome. So, you know, the death to the Western imperialist capitalist agenda is coming out the window. Capitalism is now awesome. We've decided. Any other questions? Sweet. Okay, thank you very much. No problem.